Bill. Welcome to the KK Factor. It has been a long time since we have caught up and spoken. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. I mean, we're coming out of COVID as everyone has been experiencing in Melbourne. The rest of Australia, fortunately, didn't have to go through that. But, you know, we've, we've experienced some very difficult and um, challenging. unusual times. Very challenging. But, but I'm generally well. That's good. That, that's the main thing. Well, you know, you've come out of this and it has, has it affected you in any way, the, the, the restrictions or the, the pandemic, the COVID, the virus? Has anyone in your family had to go through that? Uh, we lost a few people that I know um, through COVID. We lost the father of one of our board members, Michael Karamitos, and um, Forti, that is Forti Karamitos, passed away um, as a result of COVID. It was very disturbing and distressing, distressing to see that happen. It certainly has impacted all of our lives here in Melbourne and in Australia. And, um, you know, there's been some, some good news recently about a vaccine, which may be a game changer for all of us and bring back some normality. But, you know, it's had a profound effect on all of our lives, whether it's emotional, um, whether it's personal, uh, or whether it's financial too. It's, it's been something that none of us would have ever, ever predicted. We've seen a lot of TV programs that talk through these types of pandemics um, that we thought were science fiction. Well, guess what? It's not. It's not. Do you think, Bill, because of your own personal experience and losing people to the virus, did that change your perception of the virus um, when that happened? Like, was your idea or perception or opinion about the virus, did it change or was it the same? Look, I, I, I'm not an epidemiologist nor a no, doctor. This has got so nothing to do with from an, uh, expertise yeah. or scientists. But it's, it's important. To do with, you as, yeah, with you as being the president of the Greek community of Melbourne, Victoria, um, being Greek, being part of such a diverse community, and mm. let's be honest here, we have, we have, we, Victoria is torn, Australia is torn. We have people that think it's a conspiracy, people sure. that have not seen anyone um, catch the virus, go through the virus or pass from the virus or pass with the virus within themselves with other mm. underlying um, health issues. So I'm not going to ask you that question uh, as an expert, but, no, but, it's, but it's relevant. It, it is, is relevant, relevant but it is relevant, but we're not all epidemiologists. We all no, have no, our own no. opinions. The one way I see it is that we are guided by science. We are. Uh, we, have, we have to value and respect professions. We have to respect the people who dedicate their lives to a particular field of endeavour, which is based on facts and evidence. And I, for one, am respectful of professions, and I, for one, value the advice of those professions. So from day one, um, I have been respectful of the opinions of our leading epidemiologists and our doctors on the problems and the difficulties associated with this virus. So my opinion really hasn't changed. It didn't need someone to pass away or have a few of my cousins come down with it, which is the case as well. They caught COVID too um, and had some symptoms, but they were relatively minor. I didn't need to see that happen for me to understand the severity and the importance of this virus on people and on our community and on our society. So no, so it hasn't changed. Changed. Yeah, I've looked. I've lost people to the virus um, and I've had a very close family that it went right through the family. And it was interesting because um, with that family, it started off with the son who was part of, uh, part of the cluster at the Woolworths warehouse, took it home. The mother of the whole family who was the most fittest, so was at the gym um, watching what she ate, she actually copped it the worst and she was hospitalized, came home, and she still has, although the virus has now left her system, she still has ongoing um, other, other key factors that, you know, she just can't overcome. Um, with what you're saying, Bill, and I totally respect that because I'm in the same position, but I needed to ask that question because 
you know, there are still a lot of people in our community that are still not convinced. And although we are at zero cases now, we still know that although it's zero new cases, the virus is still out there. It's just that people haven't been tested. And we hope that those people who haven't been tested, if they do have symptoms, they're actually staying home just in case. So the numbers won't increase. Um, I also recently spoke to a newly elected um, councillor, Emily Dimitriatis. She's going to be representing the Darabin people. She, her background is law and also more importantly, she's worked as a pharmacist at the Northern Hospital. So she saw firsthand the severity and that's left an impact within her um, and her experience obviously will be able to help elderly people within her community. Bill, we've, we're opening up, restrictions are lifting. Uh, Melbourne is, is changing, Melbourne is just going to change. But Melbourne has been changing irrespective of the pandemic. We're now going to see a lot of outdoor entertaining areas, outdoor eating areas. Um, I believe personally, I believe that'll bring a lot of people back into the city um, and, I, and I think it'll be, a game changer for those who actually live in the city. Um, how do you feel with when you have still got a group of people that don't believe and then we have clusters, so they're not adhering to the rules. Will, do you believe that will impact the shop owners? Because unless they've got the QR code, um, uh, you know, they've got to have the COVID safe um, rules in place. But if you have this cluster of people that don't adhere, does that frustrate you in any way? I, I'm a person who has faith in humanity and I believe that people on the whole want to do the right thing, that people on the whole are empathetic towards other people's situations and needs. And I believe that with the lifting of these restrictions, that the majority of us will abide by the rules and that the majority of us will take care of the vulnerable because that's where the real issue lies with this virus and you, you rightly made the point it's unpredictable and um, through my law firm I've acted for a number of uh, people involved at various stages and aspects of dealing with this virus including the chief testers and some of the pharmaceutical companies etc and the point that they've made to me is that it is completely unpredictable about whom it will affect and infect it doesn't and discriminate the as they say yeah. The majority of people or a good percentage of the people are symptom free. For some people, however, it has a profound effect and impact on their health. And it's those people that we need to be mindful of. I mean, we saw what it did in our community with through the aged care homes. You know, at one stage, 20% of the deaths in Victoria were people of Greek background. Now, That's we're right. not 20% of our population. If that doesn't concern people, then I don't, I don't know what can. But um, I believe that, you know, the measures that you were referring to will be accepted and adopted by the majority of us and that we will see a rejuvenation in the city. What we do need, however, is an, an, op an opening up of offices in the CBD so that people can start working from the office I know that you know working from home has been liberating for many people. But, but not everybody can do that. Not everyone can everyone work from can home. Do it, but it's also um, not appropriate for everyone because either through their children or working or living in a very small environment. I've got lawyers in my law office who live in a 45 square apartment in the city. Now, his bedroom is his lounge room and his study. So it means in the one space. Right. He's living, working, sleeping. That's having Which mentally, on that has an impact on their mental state. Enormous yes. impact. So they can't sleep at night because they've been working in their bedroom. And I've got quite a few people that have impacted in that way. They need to come back to work. They need to see other people. They need to start socialising because at the end of the day, all of us are social animals. We thrive on our connection with other people. That's and right. And work is an important part of our self-realisation about how we feel as people. So, you know, working from home is an important game changer in terms of liberating us in terms of how often we need to come or go to work. But at the same time, mentoring, developing, 
and assisting younger aspects, younger people of um, our work, uh, um, work environments needs to happen by them being beside us. So That's you know, right. I'm looking forward to the government announcing some changes so that, you know, I know changes. I, I know the change, sorry, I'm interrupting you. I know that the government has put in a lot of um, lifting of restrictions to go back to work, but they are implementing a COVID safe going back to work. Uh, the organisation that I work have got a COVID safe um, program to transition back to work where there is um, a percentage that they will be looking at a daily basis of people being in that workspace. Um, the amount of space around the people, do they need to wear face masks? Um, and there's going to be the sanitizers everywhere. So they are playing safe. So I believe that a lot of officers are now starting to um, bring back people. Not, so it's, it's, it's that's a separate, that, yeah, because I didn't understand that if, it, okay, Legal so that's a separate. Account, financial institutions, accountancy firms um, are all still largely working from home. Um, is that because unless, of the choice or is it because of government? Um, and, and it's, it's because the of government. government that, is it because um, of the amount of people? Unless tasks you can't complete at home. And so those tasks are relatively minimal in a lot of the white collar professions. Yeah, and you can't have clients coming to your home. I get all that. Like I said earlier, not everybody can work from home. Um, Bill, the contact tracing is obviously going to be a game changer as well. Um, our Prime Minister, back on the 27th of March, made his, his statement where he did address and said that contract tracing, we had one of the best in the world. Um, obviously now they've had some issues, but do you also believe it's not just the government playing a part, it's also the responsibility of us, the people in the community, that we need to take some responsibility of our choices, our actions in moving forward, because let's face it, Contract tracing is not going to work 100% um, unless we are honest of where we've been. We are honest that we get tested just in case we have anything but the flu. I agree. I agree. The responsibility is solely ours. We can't rely upon government to basically define us as human beings. My son had a slight fever. He's 14 years old. The first thing we did was take him to get tested. We got tested as well, and we isolated until we got our results. Now, we were all clear, but we took the responsibility upon ourselves to isolate in fear of passing it on either through school or through a work environment or even through a shopping precinct. So the responsibility at the end of the day is ours. That is so true, especially even before when you touched on the, the vulnerable, the aged care. I mean, we lost... Um, let's say approximate 150 people in the first wave. Then we lost approximately 650 on the second wave. We had a period in between. Um, it's public knowledge now that the Minister of Aged Care, um, they hadn't put anything in place um, to protect the vulnerable, no COVID safe rules, regulations in place. But again, going back to what we just said, it is a responsibility of ourselves. We already knew that we lost people in the first wave and yet we still continued to become complacent um, and still go into the aged care. We still were working from site to site. Um, so we're hoping now and moving forward, obviously people you know, don't become complacent and people will put their own um, rules in place because not all aged cares were affected. Um, we saw that. I personally know of an aged care, private aged care in Clayton, uh, Clayton Clorinda area. No COVID went through that. Um, yeah. aged care yeah. facility, but that was because the owners, once the first announcement came through from our Premier, they took their own action and had PPE in there. They told their staff who were coming from overseas, I need you to stay home for 14 days. Um, some of them were jumping up and down, but they said, you know what, this is our aged care, we're yeah. in charge, um, and nothing went through that aged care. And up until a few weeks ago, I had a close friend of mine whose mother passed and the day before she passed she actually spent the night with her mum overnight at the aged care because it was free of COVID. So we know not all aged care facilities um, got affected by the COVID but it is like you said it the onus is also on us it's not just the federal government telling us you know I've got this rule in place so you can't we need to take an initiative as well. 
Absolutely, I agree entirely, Rula. Absolutely. Bill, you also have a lot of interaction and with Greece. Greece is now going through um, an, another um, outbreak. Yes. And a lot of restrictions have been put in place there. The Greek community of Melbourne, how are they embracing what's going on now in Greece? Well, it's at the end of the day, I believe we're all citizens of the world. You know, we, we travel not only physically, but these days, as you and I are doing, um, electronically through Zoom, you know, Teams, etc. So our connection is immediate and instant. And Greece was quite interested in our story um, when we went into lockdown and they made, you know, regular requests for interviews about how was it that we were dealing with it, what were we doing, and how were we feeling? And I must admit, in the interviews that I was doing with Greek TV and radio, when I was describing the restrictions that were in place, their response was, oh, my God, <laughs> how are you living like that? That's impossible. No one can live like that. And unfortunately, they're experiencing it right now. And um, so that interconnectedness uh, that we share is, is instantaneous. And um, so our thoughts go out to them. You know, Greece was one of the shining examples through the first wave. Um, Prime Minister Mitsotakis and his government did, you know, really did an excellent job in terms of containing the virus and then opening up the economy and society. Um, I'm not sure what the exact causes are for the second wave, but it appears that it's not something specific to Greece. It is throughout Europe. It is throughout because... Europe or Western Europe, some of these countries are experiencing 50,000 cases a day. We're talking about extraordinary numbers. Hospitals are filling up. So Greece is not alone. It's not but alone Bill, in this. But Bill, there is a difference it's between... It, look, there is a difference between Europe and Australia. Australia is an island surrounded by water. To get into Australia, you're either going to fly in or come in with a ship. Well, we closed our borders. You couldn't get in either Well, way. yeah, well, yeah, we sort of did and didn't, but we, yeah, I get that. Um, and now we're, our borders are closed, but we do have a bubble with New Zealand and we're still having a lot of Australians coming back. Um, Gladys, the, the Premier from um, New South Wales, announced, uh, I think it was a week or so ago, she actually specifically said that 80% of the incoming travellers are going into quarantine because 80% of them do have the virus. It's coming in from Europe. Europe, y Europe is not surrounded just by water, these individual countries. So you can walk over the border, you can ride a bike over the border, you can, um, you, can you fly. know, Pete, fly. Pete, Pete, Pete. So it, it's understandable why it's, 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 it's filtering right through, not just in one country. Oh, absolutely. And then, but then we also saw through, throughout that um, period that the rules in place, while they had some numbers of COVID cases, were not um, highly restrictive and it really appeared to be a matter of time before that virus did sweep through and um, lead to the closures that it has because you know we've seen scenes in Plataeus in in Athens and Thessaloniki only a few weeks ago where when the restaurants and cafes were closing at 11 p.m. the Plataeus were being filled with young people having a further drink and a bite to eat and um, paying no heed towards social distancing well it was only a matter of time it really and, was so, and news is breaking at the moment that um thessaloniki is becoming like the epicenter of the virus yeah, um and absolutely. like you said earlier the the hospitals are, are just becoming to totally full absolutely absolutely it's very concerning and um you know all of us have got loved ones who live in greece and and i have many not only in Athens but throughout macedonia and thessaloniki so you know, I've been in contact with them. They're in lockdown. They're not doing anything. Um, they're at home basically waiting for these three weeks to pass. But I expect the three-week lockdown is going to turn into a, a far longer period, as we've seen in Melbourne. It takes Correct. a lot longer to bring it under control. You must be very proud talking with Mitsotaki um, and other world leaders, um, if you've had that opportunity. They're looking at our Premier here in Victoria. They're looking at our Premier's roadmap. Um, and admiring what he has done, do you think they're going to take part of our roadmap and 
embrace it and put it into action with their countries, particularly well, Mitotaki with Greece? They have done it. They have done it throughout Europe, um, where they were very reluctant to impose lockdowns, even when the numbers were increasing, because of the economic impact on, on the community and society. Uh, Australia's a for, in a fortunate position where it does have reserves, where it could fund through the job seeker and job keeper um, some form of semblance of normality and uh, the capacity for people to, to live in a relatively modest way. Greece and many of these European countries don't have these economic reserves available to them and hence they were incredibly reluctant to impose a lockdown. They've been forced into that and a lot of the measures they're now taking in terms of uses of masks, um, reasons for leaving home, uh, are all largely measures that were adopted here in Victoria. So, you know, in some ways, you know, we were so proud of the work done by in Greece in March. And I think now many of the other countries throughout the world are admiring the work that's been done by all of us, not the Victorian government, by all of us uh, here in here in Melbourne. You've even got Dr. Murphy from the US. I mean, he just, he, he, he's constantly talking yeah. about yeah. Um, the Andrews government. Um, Bill, the Antipodes Festival, the largest festival in Melbourne every year. One of the largest Greek festivals in the world. In the Southern in Hemisphere, yeah. <laughs> well, not in, in Greece too, because they don't have many festivals our size. Oh, really? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's good knowledge. So, so it's I know... one of the largest Greek festivals globally. Okay, so the Antipodes Festival, I know the Greek community and the broader community are going to be wondering because we still haven't completely had all the restrictions lifted. Um, it is a mass gathering. What did we have last year? Was it 350,000 or more people go through about the 150,000, but I like 300. Did you so like 300? Okay. There you go. I was misled there. Um, do you think there is an op uh, there's a possibility that the Antipodes Festival will go through for 21? Or do you think it it's a will, little bit too soon to not? I, think, I believe we will have something, but it won't be in the form that we've been accustomed to for the last 25 years. How It'll do you do that, Bill? How, how do you cut back on the amount of people it going will through? It will become a street food festival in terms of a sit-down experience more than anything else. Okay, you, okay, that's okay, we can do that, but what about the crowd, Bill? You, you'll need to marshal people in and out. Do you honestly, Bill, believe such a festival, happen, yet such possible. a festival, because last year in February, we knew about the virus. I was invited um, that weekend to, to do a presentation on the Delphi main stage, and I still remember being cautious, worried. Um, I knew the virus was out there. It was a long, major event in Victoria. So uh, come on, Bill. In February time. last year, at the end of February, it didn't stop the crowds. How? Oh, no, no, people, people didn't at that stage appear affected, but it was our last major event in Victoria because the Grand Prix, which is a week or so later, got cancelled on that Friday. So you're right, you know, there was some trepidation. Um, I was I was actually a bit concerned as to whether people would come, but they did. They did. But I, I was a little bit concerned about whether. Are you not would concerned? Come. At the end of February twenty one, we are we going to have to a full load of people. Yes, you can have your tables and chairs out there. We still have that currently in place. You're going to put more tables and chairs, but the the broader community <laughs> bill will find a way to manoeuvre oh, through those people. <laughs> hey? We won't with them. We'll find a way to marshal people. That's assuming we get the tick from the city council and from the government. I do know that the city council and, you know, congratulations to... Oh, Sally uh, Cap. we need to congratulate Sally her again. Cap, a dear friend and good supporter of the Greek community and pledged $100,000 for the Greek precinct in Lonsdale Street in support, which is, you know, a great injection in terms of, you know, maintaining that historical link that we've got in the CBD, because although the CBD uh, no longer reflects, you know, the, the vibrancy that we have in Oakley, you know, we still can't forget the history um, of that street and its importance symbolically 
for our community because that's where everyone met in the 50s, 60s, 70s, that's 80s right. and 90s, up that's until exactly. 15 years ago. That's where people came to meet their partners, their friends, their family, to have dinner. It's where we hold our largest festival every year, and we still do. And let's not forget that the precinct, although may not be as expansive as it historically was, we now have a vertical precinct because we've got 15 levels of a Greek cultural centre that's owned right. and operated by the Greek community of Melbourne. Now, if you spread that out, that's a city block as well. It is. So, you know, that's like three Greek schools. It's got two Greek restaurants. It's got a Greek bank. It's got Greek lawyers. It's got Greek accountancies. It's got everything in it. It's so, got everything. You know, it's the one-stop the shop, as they say. The precinct has taken a different form. So, you know, it's important for us to make sure that we never turn that key and close the door on something and that we maintain an importance in the CBD because uh, a CBD and a centre is a centre. And it when is. children come to the city, they come to the centre, um, as well as hopefully expanding into the other parts of Melbourne. So that's important for us. Now, Sally Cap, um, I know is important, is it's important to her to reactivate the city. So we're working. She's with her. working very, very hard. She would. She. I would have to take my hat down to her. She's the first mayor that was able to sit and um, have that private one-on-one -on -one with the premier Daniel Andrews because of her concerns of business owners and opening up Melbourne. This is going to be so, so challenging for her. And that's another reason why I'm so really? happy that she's been re-elected because she started something, she's lived through it. She needs to continue it and get it back to where it was. Now, um, according to the interim report, there's going to be a lot of things being put in me measures, recommendations in us in moving forward to eliminate a, a, a higher risk of a third wave. Again, going back to the Antipodes Festival, because at some point we are going to have a massive festival there. QR codes are now being put in place in um, New South Wales. Uh, a lot of business owners have now been caught out where we've got Gladys, the Premier, being very disappointed because obviously she doesn't want um, further clusters. Um, so do you believe that that's going to be implemented in our business um, cafes, the hospitality industry in Melbourne? Because if we look at a festival like the Antipodes Festival, how will they monitor? At, at this point in time, some are using the QR code, the QR code, some of them are taking down names and numbers. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people, Bill, and we both know what that festival... <laughs> that, won't, that won't be possible. The government would not approve it, and it, I think it'd be irresponsible. We're talking about reimagining it in a way where it has a street food environment sitting down yeah. and controlling the movement through it. Um, <laughs> probably as best as we can reimagine it. But watch this space. I don't know the answer because we have to work with government and the and the Lord Mayor on these matters. But um, I'm aiming to have a conversation with our Premier in the next few weeks. Myself personally, I had some conversations with his chief, advi chief advisors a few weeks ago. So let's see what happens. Let's see what comes out of it. We're certainly keen to ensure that we continue to have a cultural product um, available to our community going forward. Now, the Greek community, despite COVID, didn't stop. You know, our lectures didn't stop. We continued those online every Thursday, having the most esteemed, you know, academics and scholars from around the world. Our schooling program went from strength to strength. We didn't lose one student. How um, amazing is that? With thousands of students in our student program. Um, and a lot of our other events where we could, we've continued through Zoom as we're coming out of this. Um, and as I'm about to leave you very shortly to take my son to soccer training at South Melbourne. That is um, fantastic, Bill. Melbourne um, You know, life is starting to come back in so many beautiful different ways. And, you know, we're experiencing the beauty of connecting with other people. All that. And, and, and I am with you, hopefully in person shortly. Shortly, absolutely. Look, there is a lot of good things that have come out of the um, pandemic, especially with interaction, the longing to see someone, to see a, a face and to speak to someone. People now walking the streets and actually looking up and saying hello, even through their masks, yeah, which is great. Because originally, we didn't do that anymore, Bill. We lost all that. And now and it's amazing. It's so that, lockdown, didn't it? 
Yes, it did. And the mask yeah, restriction could... has forced people now to go out, eat out, go back into the hospitality business, support the businesses, because the only way that mask comes off is if you drink and eat. So yeah. there yeah. is a lot of positives to that mask. Bill, there on that is. note, I really look forward to catching up with you um, sometime soon. Um, all the very, very best. Thank you so much for your time. And it's great Thank to have you... Laura. you continuing as our president of the Greek community of Melbourne, Victoria. And Rula, may I say on behalf of the Greek community of Melbourne, thank you for your endeavours, your good nature, um, the energy that you bring towards, you know, bringing out the information that is out there, collating it and then disseminating it so that we're all the wiser and the better and the more informed. So Rula, on behalf of all of us, Keep up the good work. Oh, thank you. I truly appreciate that from you, Bill. Thank you so, so much. Go out there. Go and enjoy your boy with the soccer. Um, say hello to everybody. <laughs> I will. I'll be waving at people from 1.5 metres away. <laughs> Bill, feel like you all the very, very yeah. best. Bye. Bye-bye.